if you are watching this on um, Zoom, please use the Q&A functions to do so. If you are uh, watching this via the face, uh, Facebook feed, then you can still send in your questions, which will be put to me and to the speaker. Um, when you raise a question, if you wish to remain anonymous, please say so, and I will not read out your uh, identifications. But nonetheless, it would still be very helpful to me if you would tell me who you are, so that it gives me a sense of um, what categories of uh, participants you are. Um, it will just help me to manage the event better, but your wish for anonymity will be respected. As you would know, the speaker we have for this webinar is Didi Kirsten Tallow, who is a very distinguished um, journalist who had worked for the South China Morning Post and the New York Times. Um, Didi was actually born in Hong Kong and raised in Hong Kong. I think she will identify herself as a Hong Kong person. She's also a graduate of SOAS and has been working on um, very widely on the political system of China, its impact on Europe, technology and worldwide transfer, the, uh, ideology, disinformation, Taiwan and Hong Kong. Now she is at the moment a senior fellow at the Ger German Council of Foreign Relations in Berlin. She is also a senior non-resident fellow at Project Synopsis in the Czech Republic. She is the co-editor and co-author of this fantastic book which I think you see on this on the screen more clearly um, about China's quest for foreign technology beyond espionage, which is also very much the focus of her presentation this evening. Over to you, Didi. Right, thank you very much, Steve. Um, really lovely to be here. Thank you very much indeed for the invitation. I um, am indeed a SOAS graduate. I, when I was there, I graduated in, I think, 1993. Um, I wasn't really, you know, in going in the technological direction or anything like that, although I was always intensely interested in politics. I think that probably came from my own background in, uh, in my own background in Hong Kong and watching China um, when it was closed, um, going there in the first time in 1984. Um, only able to speak a bit of Cantonese and north of Guangzhou was, we just had to get, we just had to manage. Um, I think, um, uh, and indeed we did, um, myself and my brother and a friend. So, you know, but what pushed me toward this direction of look, taking on something as serious as um, China's quest for foreign technology beyond espionage, as the title of the book goes, it really was the realization of just how intensely important the technolo technology question is in terms of China's rise and how intensely poorly we've understood what's happening. And I really was driven to try to examine and explore what on earth is going on. It, you know, all my years as a journalist in China, most recently from 2003 to 2017, I moved to Berlin in 2017, um, I saw a huge amount of things and wasn't necessarily able to contextualize them. And I think this is a problem that a lot of people have when they deal with China. And one of the key reasons for this is that we simply have been working in sort of quite strange and I think often um, incomplete paradigms. We've thought things were different from how they are. I think we for a long time ignored the enormous um, deliberateness uh, of the Communist Party of China and what it wants to achieve. We thought things were going to turn out differently. Um, 
I don't think too many people think that anymore. So, you know, how on earth did China even get to where it is today with this kind of economy it has today? How did it go from having essentially, and I will attempt to show this here, uh, a GDP of uh, $178 billion in 1978 to one of 14.3 trillion in 2018, that's 40 years. Well, first of all, of course, huge amount of hard work, hunger on the part of the Chinese people, ordinary people, um, ambition, a desire to, to survive, not just to survive, but to thrive. Um, but also, let's be honest, you know, a core conundrum that this book looks at is um, exactly the quote at the top there. It is the rise of China under the Communist Party as a neo-totalitarian technological power. Now the word neo-totalitarian is carefully chosen because it's to do with technology. This has been made possible through access to the science and technology created by countries it now challenges for global leadership. And that's what we're seeing is this incredible switch. First, we'll go out um, and as I will hope to show you, procure the technology, identify where it is, get it back by all means possible, and then manufacture at home um, and export back to the world as well as building up your own country, because technology is above all um, also a state building um, thing. That's what it does. So, you know, of course, Mao Zedong had um, his goals to make the West serve China, etc. And also 1956, interestingly, he said, you know, overtake Great Britain in 15 years, the US in 50 to 60. Um, Given the 2049 goal of the Communist Party to be dominant in the world, uh, technologically, um, economically, and militarily, if you add on the 30 years lost during Mao's um, intense politics and uh, the kind of the poverty that China was plunged into um, after 1949, between 1949 and 1976, 78, really, it's kind of bang, the things are kind of bang on target, actually. So that's quite a strange uh, point. But of course, the whole issue with China and technology is older than Mao. It's older than the Communist Party. And it goes back to the late 1800s, the, the um, Xiong, the idea of how is China, this very old culture of civilization, going to move into the contemporary era, it had been absolutely surrounded by colonial powers um, who did take some bits of it, not all of it ever. Um, and, you know, for a proud culture, this was a trauma, I think. And this was really the attempt um, to gain science and technology from the West was really a, a, an old attempt to overcome the, 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 the difficulties of, of Chinese culture um, in terms of modernizing. Um, so, how exactly then um, did, did this process um, take off? Well, certainly after 1949, it had a huge step forward after 1956. I'll quote here from this from the book, since 1949, a vast, deliberate and unique, that's important, unique system of foreign technology spotting and transfer has operated in China and overseas. Very little of it is secret. This is also important. It's written in Chinese. A lot of people haven't bothered to read or can't read the material. The projects are described in party and state documents announced in the media and ex executed in venues that are broadly speaking, not hidden from the outside world. Again, we get back to the idea that one of the reasons we haven't really understood what China was doing was because we haven't really been looking and we've been living in a certain thought paradigm that has not encouraged us um, to look too closely. It's been driven mostly by the desire to, you know, make money and this sort of rather arrogant Western belief actually that China would just change and become like us. Um, not so, um, at least not under the Communist Party. I think that's of course the key here is the party. And I am talking about the Communist Party all the time now. Um, so, you know, beginning in at least the 1950s, in 1956, we had a very interesting quote from Zhou Enlai, who was, of course, the premier, but he was also China's leading intelligence officer, which is relevant when you're talking about technology transfer um, in terms of setting the mindset for a lot of this activity. Um, when China was building at the first long-term science and technology plan, and they produced a first draft in 1956, I think it was indeed, and presented it to Zhou Enlai. Zhou wasn't happy with it. He said, doing science is like fighting a war. 
They've been working all these years on constructing the first long-term science and technology plan for China, and you haven't even set up an intelligence agency. How can you fight this war? And that's quite thought-provoking, isn't it? I think that it sort of sets the scene for, for, this, for this technology um, push, uh, because it suggests one thing very important about it, which is that a lot of these methods are, in fact, you know, to do in the borderline, the gray zone of, of what is espionage, what is, what is legal, what is illegal and such. And, and I think that that's very much a reflection of the entire mindset in China. It's a mindset of a communist party, um, which was of course born in conspiracy, seized power in revolution and held on to power through um, dictatorship and all that goes with it, for example, terror but also, of course, um, the sense of economic progress um, and that people supported it. So it's, it's, a, it's a mixed situation. Um, earliest successes, you might know of Tian Xuesen, uh, who came back from America. There's a very good uh, Tian Xuesen uh, Museum in Shanghai, which if anyone in China, I encourage you to go and take a look. Above all, a very intelligent system was built up in China construction of a massive system of information gathering. Libraries, specialist libraries with really extraordinary abilities and um, detail management, vision. You know, when one looks in the, into the literature in Chinese, um, it's astonishing how good the system is and also how quickly it can grow, develop, um, how it's bringing in AI, all kinds of stuff now. Um, so, you know, essentially you have in China, after all these decades um, of building up through policies, through party documents in very disparate ways, but always guided by this idea of gaining technology and building a state uh, for the Communist Party. We've got, there are about 100,000 s and information, information researchers alone. So focusing on science and technological information gathering and their work feeds into this policy system it feeds into the party system, of course, as well. Um, and, you know, that's just something that there just, just simply doesn't exist um, anywhere else in the world, which is why when people say, oh, but all developing countries steal technology or but, oh, but all countries steal technology, which is something that I hear a lot, there, people are wrong to say that. They're wrong to think it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. We're talking about a much bigger, more minutely worked out, more deliberate, um, system with a very clear set of goals in mind. Nine, in 2001, importantly, five ministries, Ministry of Science and Technology, the Ministry of Personnel, aka the Ministry of Human Resources and, uh, and uh, Social Security, the um, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Education, and the uh, Ministry of Public Security, issued a policy, a joint five ministry policy, which in the book we call the multiple means formula. Um, basically, it was um, that first quote should say technology, technology should be transferred by multiple means. There are other variations there. What this is, is you know, a carte blanche to provide whatever is useful, wherever it is found. So first to do that, you have to identify where it is in the world. You have to figure out how to get hold of it. And what this then produced was really um, a very wide range, legal, illegal and gray zone methods. One example here would be the China Association of Science and Technology. This is a uh, key organization within China. It's national, but it's also at the provincial level and the local level. This is one of the key organizations that China, um, that the Communist Party has identified as a way to reach out into the outside world, into America, into Europe, into Japan and Korea. Of course, we're not just talking about the West, we're talking about the developed industrial nations of the world, wherever they are. Um, so, you know, what's important about caste um, is not just all the programs that it co-runs and um, the technologies are identified and so the sheer energy and, and power behind this uh, ability to, to get tech technology back to China through cooperations, through, through conferences, through you know, university partnerships, so all kinds of things. Um, 
but also that it is part of the United Front Work Department, which means that we are now straying fully into very political territory. Um, and that's because I think that a key aim of the United Front Work Department and of United Front Work more broadly in China is in fact to, um, to spot and to bring back foreign technology and also talent again to strengthen the Communist Party, to grow the economy and to achieve that great rejuvenation uh, of China, the China dream to overtake the world essentially in 2049. Um, you know, what's interesting here is, and, and this speaks to our inability for so long to really understand what was going on, what the Communist Party was doing with technology. Um, this is the homepage in Chinese, Wang Chuxian, You'll all recognize, many of you will recognize that. It's a Xi Jinping quote, don't forget your roots. Um, you know, adhere to your destiny. Essentially it's saying, be what you already are, which is a loyal citizen of China. Don't think you can change. Don't think you should change. Work for us, uh, repay the mother country. And this is of course a message to Chinese people, citizens um, in China and throughout the world. And also of course, very troublingly for many people for to overseas Chinese who will also be claimed by the party in similar ways. In English, it's quite a different experience to look at their homepage. The homepage of CAST looks terribly sober. Te ton, uh, top 10 achievements, life sciences in China in 2020, like a nice sort of spacey page there, you know, um, materials, etc. It's a completely different atmosphere, you know, and, and I think that this is a big part of why this policy has been so successful, because, you know, foreigners will, of course, go to the English, for example, if they don't read Chinese, which, let's face it, very few non-Chinese people do read Chinese, and they'll see this, and people think, oh, well, that's, you know, Sounds great. And there'll probably be some message there now um, about, you know, fighting the coronavirus, collaboration with the WHO. But again, just compare these two things, you know, in a sense, what's been going on has been a kind of a parallel story. One story for Chinese readers, Chinese speakers, Chinese people, citizens, whom the party targets uh, in order to deploy for its goals. And another story for foreigners who are the target um, of much of this activity and who need to be kind of won over in a way that doesn't make people anxious and doesn't make people realize just how much the goal is to in fact bring technology and therefore power, um, you know, to bring it back to China and therefore to create power that will then go back out into the world in the form of science and technology and economy. Um, it reflects this basic thing of um, the inside and the outside are different and as Tom Ganyuan, uh, who wrote a book about being reunited front cadre that published in 2016, wrote um, the, the basic idea of the United Front was that the insider knows the ropes and the outsider is just along for the ride. Even within China, people who were not part of the United Front system often really had very little idea what was going on. The United Front system, of course, being, you know, um, a uh, organization of the Communist Party tasked with connecting to organizations outside the Communist Party, both in China and overseas, with the aim of co-opting them for the party. It's essentially rooted in revolution and the need to, to win over the enemy, um, if you possibly can, or win over friends, first of all, and then to essentially grow, increase your power. So again, we get back to the United Front because I think a lot of this technology transfer issue is closely connected to United Front activities. And um, later on, I'll show you some more of uh, how that works, for example, in Germany. Primarily, you know, I think the United Front is the strategy. It's also a bureaucracy. It's work carried out by the whole party. Um, it's designed to be hard to define, hard to see. Plausible deniability is built into a lot of this activity, mostly within China, but also overseas. So, um, here I get into some detail um, and you get into what is the construction of a pipeline, what I think of as a pipeline, which begins with undergraduate students um, overseas who go overseas. Now nearly 6 million um, university students have gone overseas from China since approximately um, 1978, most of them since 1978, of course. Um, several million have gone home, several million are still overseas. And, um, 
basically the party you know aims for both sets the ones who stay overseas and the ones who go home to contribute to to pay back the mother country now i don't think the party really minds which way you choose so you go back that's great you stay overseas that's great because there's a whole system of um and i'll actually skip forward to show you the, the language there's a whole system of uh, appealing to uh, PRC students who go overseas, and we're talking mostly science and technology students here, um, powerful repeated appeals to loyalty to the ancestral country, Zhu Guo. Uh, and Xi Jinping has given speeches here, some of the phrases they use to continually keep up the pressure. You must never forget that you are first and foremost a citizen of the PRC. Full assimilation overseas is not desired. You should pay back to the motherland serve the country, repay the motherland, match talent to need. That's about saying, okay, I'm overseas, I'm a physicist, uh, I work on new materials or whatever, and you know, um, I then can work with a organization back home, which has been set up to bring exactly back this, to, to receive the technology that I can bring back in by multiple means to commercialize it in China, to turn it into actual economy, into business, into product, and therefore to grow the economy and to grow national strengths. Gather talent all over the world and use it for China. That's pretty clear. I think the last one is in a sense, the most interesting. For those who return to the ancestral land, a place to use their weapon, um, that's a metaphor it just means a place to um literally it means a place to use your weapon but of course it just sort of means a place to use your 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 talents or your skills to deploy yourself for those who remain in foreign countries a gateway to serve their country and this is extremely important because um I think that China realized at some point the government realized at some point that a lot of people did want to stay overseas and um so what would they do they didn't want to lose the talent you know, it was a question of national development. The party didn't want to lose the talent. They didn't want the brain drain. We're all familiar with the uh, issues of brain drain from China, I think. Uh, they've been discussed for many years now. So the idea was that China, you know, the party then moved to start setting up a kind of a, a kind of a parallel system. There are, um, within China, there are uh, about 200 uh, technology transfer parks, innovation centers, at least. Um, there were 200, excuse me, back in 2013. Today, there are about 2,000, and many of them are called double bases. So basically, you would have um, a base in China, and then you'd have a connection point overseas, for example, in the US or in Belgium or in Germany. And these places would often be talent workstations. There'd be workstations that, were, that are sort of tasked with keeping the connections back to China alive, for example, to CAST, to universities to commercialization enclaves in China, and also to do the same work in Europe, in business parks increasingly, um, and in um, commercial venues. Also, you know, here we have again the issue of this Chinese Student Scholar Associations. Um, there are hundreds of these around the world. Um, I recently counted together with my colleague Cheryl Yu, 265 in the US, 80 plus in Germany alone, about 93 in the UK. Um, and what we then did in order to figure out, you know, this is the first port, port, the first point in the pipeline, if you like, this is where it all begins. Chinese students come overseas and they join a CSSA for lots of often innocent reasons, like where do I get decent food in this place? Or how on earth do I rent a flat when I'm faced with German bureaucracy? It could be really difficult, right? So this kind of community support, this moral support, the friendship, this is all completely understandable and um, you know, very valuable. And then it comes with the strings attached because a lot of these, um, a lot of these CSSAs are indeed very closely, in fact, they're all attached to the embassies or consulates, but often their leadership, for example, is actually chosen or it's suggested to a certain type of uh, student that they might want to become the leader of the local CSSA. And then you know, this is almost invariably taken up um, you know, it, it's a mixed picture, but but this is definitely happening. And um, we did some counting on Europe, for example, um, you know, so us obviously in the UK, I'm in Berlin, so we take Europe as an example. We counted um, the next step of this whole process, which is the professional guilds. And 
So after kids graduate, um, get a job, stay here, maybe they go work for BASF, the biggest chemical company in the world, down in Ludwigshafen in Germany, for example. And um, they then join the local chemical engineers guild, yeah, uh, which happens to be located just outside BASF in Ludwigshafen. It's in Karlsruhe, which is really close by. Um, and we counted 95 of these kinds of professional associations for working Chinese uh, PRC citizens, usually still, uh, who've graduated from university in Europe and in Germany maybe, or from somewhere else and have come here to work. And um, of these 95 professional associations, um, 47 of them stated on their own websites that they engage in technology transfer back to China through these sort of workstations, as they call them, through these multiple connections back to universities, to companies, to, to government um, ministries at the local level, at the provincial level, just an absolute um, extraordinary range and detail um, in how these connections all work. And they're then gathered together in Germany under, in fact, in Germany, but for all of Europe, um, with something called the um, FCPAE, the Federation of Chinese Professional Associations in Europe, um, which organizes an annual conference in a European city. Uh, last year uh, was, I think, online. The year before that was in Dublin and the year before that in Helsinki. Last year's was supposed to be in Manchester. They were reacting to Brexit um, by going to Ireland in 2019 and Manchester in 2020. Um, that was the plan to explore opportunities um, for science and technology cooperation, as it's always called, and um, friendship and such like. Um, you know, in, in the UK and Ireland after Brexit. So um, yeah, the technology transfer parks back in China that's been set up over the years, the double base system. So therefore it's increasingly practiced overseas as well. Um, the talent plans are extremely important. People have heard of the thousand talent plan by this point, but there may be as, as many as 500 of these at work. They're set up in China, they make competitions um, and they try to stay spot talent overseas. Um, an example here, Charles Lieber, Harvard University, there's a lot of money involved here. Charles Lieber was reportedly offered 50,000 US dollars. Um, this is all uh, at the allegation level um, to, to uh, work in, with a Wuhan um, Institute University. Um, and, it, you know, so it, it, this is a really complicated area and, and it's um, buttressed by the fact that China has a lot of cash it's got big state funds able to pay these things. The universities will do that. Um, again, we get back to the United Front connections for this technology outreach. Who does the outreach? Well, the science and technology diplomats or the education section diplomats at consulates and embassies around the world. Um, these connect to, you know, as we said, students, researchers, business. The Zhigong Party and the Western Return Students Association are United Front organizations. Importantly, too, um, when we're talking about the United Front and its role in organizing at least some of this and somehow also shading a lot of the work that happens in, and sort of giving you the kind of framework um, is to know that the Ministry of State Security does work through the United Front as well. Um, we looked at that one. What are the solutions to all of this? So there's a lot more detail about, you know, the actual examples of this. And in our book, we've got um, concrete examples, such as the um, example of NukeTech, a um, piece of uh, technology developed in Europe, in the UK, Britain, and France in the uh, very late um, 1980s, early 90s, that was then literally copied and um, developed at Tsinghua University, which had this, you know, ability to commercialize its research. This is something that the Chinese system is very good at. It um, commercializes research very quickly. Western universities are not good at that at all. They come up with amazing developments, innovations, and then just basically don't do anything with them. Um, you know, this is the power of the state working, um, economic statecraft, pushing, pushing the country forward all the time under the Communist Party. Um, and um, Nuke Tech essentially, you know, was set up by the son of uh, Hu Jintao. Uh, he's called Hu Haifeng. And uh, Nuke Tech has now become uh, the largest provider of um, cargo security and people scanning security solutions at railways, ports, airports um, in Europe. It occupies about 80% of the market. Um, 
you know, it's been hit with dumping charges because it was uh, constantly sold below market rate. Um, it donates equipment or it offers it in loans in sensitive areas like in the Western Balkans um, with explicit provisions such as, you know, this costs this much, but if you can't afford it to say the Republic of you know, Srpska, then they say, well, in 30 years, if you haven't paid it back, we'll just drop the whole thing. So it's clear that there's also, you know, constituency building with this kind of activity. And again, there's always a state behind this stuff. Nobody else can compete with a cheap price of this technology, which was originally, you know, developed in Europe, taken to China, literally copied from from whatever material people could get their get their hands on, and then has been manufactured, sent back out into the world, and started to corner and dominate markets. Um, and that's technology transfer of one kind too. There's lots of examples in the book about um, military technology, um, which is of course a whole issue of its own. But I thought perhaps I would. Um, leave you there with some of these solutions, some of the key ones. Um, primarily, number one, what do we do about all of this? Well, there's a huge debate about what to do about all of this because nobody wants to end open collaboration. Nobody wants to cut chances for individuals. Nobody wants to demonize people, but we do need to face this problem because it is becoming really, well, it's long become out of control and it's you know actually attacking the core foundation of economies um, in democratic countries too. And the, um, you know, what, so what are we gonna do? First of all, I think we need to do an enormous amount more of due diligence. We need to invest in the research. We need to know what we're talking about. We need to know about these policies in China. We need to know about the system, the structure, who does what, what are they actually doing? You know, um, it's really extraordinary how little we know <laughs> we're really working in the dark. And I have to say that, once I, st when I started researching this book myself, and, and this interest goes back to roughly 2013 when I was still working in China, I began to come across this stuff. So it's been nearly a decade now. It really was like a process of switching the light on in a dark room. You know, you could suddenly understand what was going on around you. And I think this is something that, you know, to understand the intention and the, the methods, the tactics, the techniques of what the party is doing to identify technology, how they get it back to China. Um, I think, you know, the rest of the world needs to do this too. That's it. it's pretty much what we need to do. So um, I think specifically, we need to raise the cost of joining the Communist Party for talented Chinese people, scrutinize CCP, CCP membership in, you know, in our interactions with Chinese uh, companies, researchers, universities, I think we do need to start doing this. And I actually think since it's a one party state, I think that's a completely reasonable thing to do. It's not like saying, well, you're a member of the Tory party, whatever, because in a democracy, the system is profoundly fundamentally different from one in a one party state in a dictatorship, where being a party member absolutely raises the risk that you will be called upon to do certain things, to serve the party, to serve the motherland. That's not to say that people who are not party members don't get drawn into it, they do through a variety of methods. But I think that raising the cost for talented Chinese people of joining the party, the thought that, well, if I am in the party, I actually might not be able to get that scholarship to go and research you know, um, nuclear physics in um, uh, you know, the Leopoldina uh, National Academy of Sciences in Germany. I might not get that because you know, Germany's worried. They don't actually want Communist Party members from China um, working within their systems because these systems are, at the end of the day, high research, uh, you know, and have national security implications. So that's the third um, suggestion. Of course, exclusion from sensitive research, particularly PRC nationals or CCP members. Um, yeah, we need to do a huge amount more strategic communication with universities and companies. Politics needs to understand what's going on. Leaders need to understand what's going on. European leaders are very bad at that, frankly. They don't really have the knowledge they need. Um, there isn't enough knowledge about China by a long way. This is crucial awareness and strategically communicate this um, within their own societies. And last but not least, law enforcement action. It's, um, it's a tricky area, but there's considerable confusion, for example, here in Germany about who even should one turn to when one notices that information is, is being siphoned off. 
Um, do you go to the police? Do you go to the state's level? Do you go to the uh, German so-called FBI, the Verfassungsschutz uh, um, people? Do you go to the to the national level? Who do you go to? You know, and as a result, just a small percentage of cases I ever prosecuted from the technology theft from businesses or or in uh, research institutions or universities. So I think, um, I hope there's lots of questions. I, I'm not quite sure how I'm doing for time, Steve. Um, perhaps you could, uh, if you wanted to exit the screen and we could get onto the questions, I think that that might be, or maybe I can do it in fact. Thank you, Didi. I think it is a really interesting presentation that you have made. Uh, we already have a number of questions being raised. Before I open the floor, as usual, let me start off by asking you a question. Um, you raise two very important points. One is that the Chinese government are using the overseas Chinese communities, particularly the student or uh, academic communities of ethnic Chinese origins for the efforts to secure foreign technologies. And you also then suggest that the important counter, one important countermeasure is to scrutinize um, and screen out Communist Party members if they are trying to get engaged into that kind of sensitive technological institutions. And I thought implicitly there is a bit of a contradiction there, and I would like you to clarify whether I am, I am reading it right or not. Because if the whole issue is primarily one of members of the Communist Party, mm. then it cannot be very effective. Um, the, even though there are 90 million members of the Communist Party, you're talking about a population of over 1.3 billion. Mm -hmm. so it's not really that high a percentage yet. Mm -hmm. And the overwhelming majority of Chinese students and scholars overseas Mm. are not Communist Party members. Yeah, I know, yeah. So isn't there a, a bit of a disconnect? Unless your assumption is that the Chinese government's efforts to recruit overseas Chinese students and scholars are not very effective if they are not members of the Communist Party. Could you clarify? Yeah, sure. No, I think the thing is that this idea um, it is a really difficult issue to deal with, Steve, because nobody wants to um, nobody wants to discriminate based on anything. You know that's appalling, and everybody, you know, and and it's it's something that's often used against people trying to draw attention to this risks, the, the massive risk we face with this situation um, is that you know somehow one is racist. I mean that's complete nonsense, but it's manipulated. It's an argument that's taken by the party and thrown back at people who are trying to deal with a, a very neutral kind of political risk. Um, that, and it's somehow turned into a racial argument by the party. This is to be completely energetically and utterly rejected. So I think the reason for focusing first of all on the party is that saying, well, nobody from the PRC can come, that's really, really difficult. It's in a sense, it's not fair. Um, it's counterproductive and it carries with it an enormous sort of set of problems as well. So how does one actually manage the problem? Well, sure, a lot of the students are not party members, but it's important to remember that there are all kinds of different students going overseas. And very often these CSSAs, for example, are led by quite politically ambitious um, PRC students, people who do actually want a career in politics back in China. So these are kind of key people, if you like. Now, if people who have that kind of ambition, and many of these people will be party members, actually, um, if they, you know, for a start, have problems, you know, if that's a kind of a practical block, as well as a symbolic message to China, don't send party people abroad to take on these positions to run these kinds of CSSAs, which some of which are fine and some of which are absolutely not fine, you know. Um, 
because um, it, it will it may cost you in future, you know, because you might not be able to do it because we're just going to say we don't actually want the Communist Party operating in an underground hidden fashion among us in democratic countries, the political risk is simply far too high. So it's kind of a, a mixture of being a practical block, given the prominence of some individuals within the system and how they can then act on the other individuals within the overseas Chinese uh, student or professional system and the disproportionate influence they will have. And it's also a symbolic gesture to say, look, we kind of know what you're doing and um, you need to stop. <laughs> So I think that that I, I hope that that answers your questions. I think that the next step might be indeed to to look even more thoroughly at who's coming in, what they're studying, um, or it's something that should be done in parallel, certainly keeping out um, PRC researchers, I'm afraid from, you know, sensitive areas is going to become increased, the pressure there is going to grow and grow. And that's another huge problem, of course, because under conditions of military civil, civil fusion in China, Who's to say what is a sensitive area? Everything's a sensitive area. That's kind of the goal by the party. They kind of want to fuse everything, you know? It's a sort of fusion system that, of course, Stalin also operated. Um, and, you know, de de democracies operate very differently. They operate under separation, separation of powers to keep things safe for the individual. Um, but there we, you know, there we are right up against the political um, issue that we're trying to deal with here. Okay. I hope that, that answers your question. I hope it does. Thank you very much. So <laughs> um, there is a kind of a slightly uh, complimentary question that comes from David uh, Tiffield. And he would like to ask you how easy is it to check if somebody is a member of the Communist Party? Yeah, well, it's not. <laughs> as I suspect you all know. Um, but, you know, if one puts up rules, it's a bit like saying, well, you know, sure, people can lie, but there are ways of finding things out. Um, I myself have recently seen uh, a list of uh, 5,700 members of the Communist Party who work for a particular company, a foreign company, um, which, um, you know, so look, there are ways and um, I, you know, some of these lists are moving around um, and, uh, you know, there are ways to manage these situations, they won't be 100%, but you can't assume that you're going to lie and be able to get away with it. And the minute you lie, um, you are legally liable, you know, it's a bit like saying, um, it's a bit like, uh, well, it's a bit like sort of a taxation system, isn't it? It's like, you know, you can lie about your taxes, but if we catch you, you're going to be in serious trouble. And in fact, this is exactly how they have been identifying and uh, arresting people in the US now with the Department of Justice's China initiative. Often it's through things like financial issues. You know, you declare your taxes, you say, this is all I have, but it turns out, you know, you may be getting more, quite a lot more. Um, you're not declaring it. You're keeping it in a bank account in China, for example. So, you know, there are ways of doing it. Okay. Um, next question I pick comes from Charlie Parton of Rusi. When a Chinese company buys into a foreign company, perhaps only 5 to 10%, does it get the right to access the technology? Under what circumstances, short of a majority, is access to the technology permitted? Well, that really depends on the agreement, I think, that the two companies strike. And I think that one of the problems we've had is that Western companies or, you know, companies from industrialized countries have been extremely generous in their uh, technology transfer to China. That's the basic system of tech for trade. So it's basically like we give our technology to you, you manufacture in China, you know, you do it cheaply because uh, you don't pay the workers too much and, you know, we make a huge amount of money and so do you, right? So tech for trade is, but tech for trade is one of um, only 32 methods that we identified in our book of technology transfer. And it's probably the least problematical in the sense that the company can simply say, we're not signing this. And, you know, if they can't then, go and do their business in China, well, they should go, they can go and do it somewhere else. I mean, there does need to be some sense of responsibility um, and, you know, kind of um, agency among companies in the West as well. Um, but, you know, I mean, Chinese company, Western company technology, again, 
Western companies need to look at what they're transferring over and whether or not it's worth it in the long run. A small example, somebody I know um, developed a system for uh, how to deal with sewage waste from high-speed trains. Now, this is quite detailed. Um, it's completely brilliant, right? And he's been working with China for a long time as an engineer. And uh, he's, you know, the idea is that he's gonna sell this for a certain sum of money. But if he were just to stay, stay, you know, in control of the technology and, uh, and not sell it to China for a certain amount of money, he would probably over time, eventually, you know, the idea is make a huge amount more money. So, I mean, what, what price are we actually selling our technology for? We tend to think that we're just giving second rate stuff or stuff and we will stay ahead with innovation. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. And I think we're starting to feel that, that the catch up isn't working anymore. But for Charlie's point, I think like the main point is like it's going to be up to the companies to to decide what is the terms of their agreements together. And do they actually want to, um, you know, work with 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 a with a country where the laws are so clearly aimed at getting technology from from themselves, from their company? Okay, I'll move on. Um, next question comes from William Knight, also from London. Um, in your research, were you able to determine the likely average time it takes for a Western company entering into a technology transfer agreement with a Chinese technology partner for technology supply to become redundant because the Chinese partner has reached the point where it has obtained all it needs in the first instance. Right. Uh, the short answer to that is no, we didn't, because it's not really germane to the book. Um, the book is about essentially about legal, illegal and gray zone technology transfer. And it was about sketching the system, um, examining for the first time, actually, what's happening in Europe, also in Japan and Korea. Those are also unique chapters in, in this book. Um, so this, this again, this is the tech for trade situation that I mentioned, one of 32 methods. Um, and no, so I, we haven't, we didn't address that in the book, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that um, it, it uh, look, I mean, I'm sure that there are a legion of different um, possibilities for that kind of thing. I think that there are, will be other uh, sources where you could, where you could go for that. One thing that's very interesting, really, your question prompts me to, to, to say is that it's striking how many sort of experts in this field really didn't themselves understand for the longest time what was going on. And the reason for that, I think, is that they simply weren't looking at this from an intelligence point of view. Now, I had nothing to do with the intelligence world. I don't work in it. I'm a think tanker, former journalist. Um, but you know, what this book draws on is all open source. And, you know, open source and classified intelligence are two different things in the West. We, we, we differentiate quite carefully. And yet 95% of intelligence is open source. You know, that's kind of like uh, something that people very often kind of say is a sort of a ballpark figure. And it's in a way China's ability to use open source so cleverly that has enabled the growth of this really extraordinary system. Um, I think that that's something that we might actually need to change moving forward is to become more sort of, how should I put it, more intelligentized about how we use information as well. So um, that's just a thought prompted by, by the question. And, you know, of the 32 methods of technology transfer, I mean, the speed of transfer is impossible to, to it's impossible to estimate. I think that, you know, if you were talking actual cyber espionage, um, you know, it would be faster. If you're talking about cultivating an individual who goes overseas and works in the German Research Institute and then goes back and works in the China Academy of Engineering Physics, which is down in Mianyang in Sichuan province and develops and designs China's nuclear weapons, um, then you might be talking, you know, many years. Okay, next question that I pick comes from a uh, SOAS student, uh, Bethant Howell. Uh, would you say that foreign technology acquisition in the PLC is still outstripping Chinese domestic innovation, or is Chinese technology production catching up now? 
Yeah, that's a super important point. There's no question that um, innovation is growing in China. Um, mostly what is growing is what's known as secondary innovation. So innovation off things that have taken place elsewhere. One great example of that would be the WeChat app, which is of course, I think, um, well, it is highly, highly uh, insecure, um, but it's very practical, easy to use. Everyone loves it in China and you know, in other places too, TikTok being another example. Um, people will know exactly where you are when you're using these apps, anywhere in the world really. Um, Tencent will know that's the owners. So, um, you know, and we'll be watching and listening. So um, that's, you know, people say that WeChat, et cetera, is better than various other Western forms. That's possibly true. Um, so that would be a very good example of secondary innovation. When we're talking about basic innovation, I think that there still are problems there for sure. Um, and, you know, I think that that really has to do with um that really has to do with quite complex cultural factors that are sort of difficult to get into briefly um the political is one aspect of it uh that the the lack of desire to to um just sort of let people go and let them um explore completely um freely i mean and also the education system of course requires a certain amount of certain style of teaching perhaps to even learn Chinese. I mean, the sheer rote memorization required doesn't exactly lend itself to, you know, sitting around blue sky thinking from a young age. So there's something of a contradiction right there, I do think. Okay. Next question I pick comes from Graham Hutchings of the Oxford China Center and the University of Nottingham. Um, he thanks you for your authoritative presentation. In the light of your findings, is there a case for curtailing or even ending the presence of Confucius Institutes in universities in democratic countries? Um, yeah, thank you, Graham, um, for the question. Uh, yes, <laughs> there is. Um, Sweden's done it. You know, I looked up the website of a Confucius Institute at a German university recently, and you know, amid all the controversy swirling around the Uyghur regions, what's happening there, the forced labor issues, the camps, which we've seen on satellite images, many, we've heard so many first person uh, testimonies. And you know, that's just one of very, very many um, really severe human rights problems that have um, taken place uh, over the years consistently, never ending really, um, sort of a fairly benighted situation um, in China. And, uh, you know, the website, the website of this Confucius Institute was all about, look, you know, here's this nice historical thing, uh, Tang Dynasty, something or other. Um, here's, you know, how to do the spot of uh, you want to learn calligraphy, come and have some language classes. And it was like a parallel universe to all of that stuff. There was no uh, examination of um, the problems. Now you could say, well, we don't need to examine problems all the time. That's true, we don't. But we do also need to examine problems that take place because at the end of the day, people want to work towards happier, safer societies and happier, safer people. And you're not gonna be able to do that if you don't tackle problems. So, you know, I see, I think it's very, very uh, risky. I think it's wrong. I think it's, uh, you know, to, to enable this kind of sanitized version of China to dominate within academic institutions in the West. And a key reason why it's risky um, is because it means that the Western institutions themselves won't pay for it when they need to, because if they want to keep control over their research, they need to be independent. They need to be financially independent. They cannot hand over power to Beijing to tell the China story well, as Xi Jinping wants all Chinese people to, and he wants foreigners to kind of fall in line with that too. Um, 
so it's you know it's dangerous it's, i think it's very very risky from many points of view now if china wants to have institutes um that do those things you know cultural affairs and calligraphy tea and pipa and, and whatever fantastic stuff um it should do so as a chinese government sponsored cultural institute operating independently outside of the halls of academe the precious um knowledge resources that you know countries have built up over decades hundreds of years um within free democratic societies to really uh pursue excellence and knowledge and they should do so outside but they should not be mixing propaganda with real research so i think absolutely we need to shut we need to simply ask them to go go and do it somewhere else do it in the embassy or do it in a independent situation but no not 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 in universities okay next question comes from the face um, uh, the facebook feed and the question is how successful is china in obtaining foreign technology at an overall level and whether there are structural weaknesses for china's approach to obtain foreign technology okay i'm not quite sure um well how successful is it overall, overall level means right okay um it's massively successful that's why we wrote the book um it's extraordinarily successful think for a minute you know this is where we get into these different worlds like what we think or what foreigners think china has done and what's actually been going on are very two very different things often and um you know one reason of course again is the language keeps a lot of people out um it, it's enormously successful the the sheer growth of china's economy the figures that i read out at the beginning 178 billion in 1978 to i think 14.3 trillion in 2018 just 40 years later simply wouldn't have been possible without technology transfer from the west because so much of this technology has been brought over by foreign companies or was brought um by students returning from overseas or was sent back from overseas or has been you know taken by theft we've had lots and lots of cases um one in germany in cologne a lanxess uh the, the company the usual technology theft situation a usb stick or stuff going back and then you know competitor is set up in china often who worked at the other company in the first place and then goes back with the knowledge and sets up a another company and then they go turn up at a trade fair and offer their same product made much more cheaply and um off the technology theft to the same buyers and then that's when the whole thing it gets realized of what's going on it's been enormously successful so much of that economic growth i think came from this entire mindset of, of um you know needing to get hold of this technology from the west which i do understand because we need to think back you know on one level i understand it we need to think back to why china um was so far behind why it fell behind in the first place in the late 1880s and the whole arrival of the uh, tielong the iron dragon which was the railway i think the first one was built by germans in china if i'm not wrong um you know um and 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 the impact that that had on a very proud civilization a very proud culture a very wonderful culture in many ways and the actual existential fear you know of of not being able to assert themselves now when the communists came along you know being communist party and a dictatorship and uh you know leninist party which uh, the vanguard of the people so that people never get a say in things basically because there's a party to speak for them at all times or to tell them what to do etc um you know that then turned into a very very powerful weapon that 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 longing to catch up or that determination to catch up became used against the west because the communist party always planned to you know overtake the west or to to kind of beat the capitalist countries and here i think i actually wanted to uh thought it might be nice to read a little quote from the book if i may um you know in 2013 xi jinping uh quoting deng xiaoping who was of course um a leader before who before jiang um before xi um pointed out that quote we are carrying out socialist modernization to catch up with the developed capitalist countries economically and politically create a higher and more effective democracy 
than the capitalist countries. Moreover, we will train more and better skilled persons than in those countries. So there you can see how important the science and technology and training and knowledge was to Deng's plan for China after the death of Mao to kind of join a world socialist modernization as they call it. Um, and of course, when he talks about higher and more effective democracy, they're talking about the so-called uh, democratic, you know, people's democratic dictatorship. They're talking about leadership by the party. They're not talking about the democracy that Democrats have. So, you know, science and technology was essential to this political rise of the Communist Party. So overall, it's been enormously successful. Um, it's an absolutely brilliant system. It's probably the single most brilliant system of technology um, acquisition um, in the world. You know, uh, there, there isn't anything even near it somewhere else. So any more specific questions there? Are there any structural weaknesses? Structural weaknesses? Um, well, there probably are. Um, we really address the strengths. That's a good question. Um, because the strengths are manifold, enormous input from the ministries. Um, you know, you've got this sort of situation in China where you've got, for example, the Ministry of um, Industry and Information Technology, MIIT, and it's like a pillar, right? But then when you go across, there's the MSS, that's another pillar, and they connect. They connect very, very directly. So really, you've got um, the MSS able to use everything that the MIIT is doing and MIIT um, needing, you know, benefiting also from what the MSS does. Um, and that's simply, you know, the, 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 that's the structural, if you like, the structural reality of the, uh, of the um, one party state. So um, structural weaknesses, probably they would be in areas like provincial competition or something like that. But again, you know, um, that's not limited to foreign technologies. So I would focus more on the strengths here. I think there's enough reason to focus on the strengths. Um, mm. Is China more successful? some types of foreign technologies yeah i don't know um china casts a very very wide net it's looking for everything it's always looked for everything from 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 very early days um nothing really is too small to be of interest some foreign countries make the mistake of saying well but we only have five million people they're not interested in us that's just not the case okay next question i pick comes from a source phd student media how um it was reported that the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson will use the Queen's speech next month to announce a bill to counter hostile states, including a foreign agent's registration scheme, which would require all individuals working on foreign governments in the UK to register their presence. <coughs> Just sorry. Do you think the CSSAs and the CCP members in the UK should be included in the scope of this bill. Thank you. Yeah, this is the difficult question. And I think that um, actually, yeah, I think we do need to include the CSSAs in this and other organizations. For example, I mentioned earlier the FCPAE, the um, Federation of Chinese Professional Associations in Europe, which is in Frankfurt. But it's, it's look, look I, I went down there to take a look at the place. It's in a suburb of Frankfurt. It's a residential suburb. Nobody's been in that house for a long time. I talked to the neighbors, um, you know, there's dust on the doorstep. It's a kind of a front. Um, the people who should be living there, whose names are on the doorbell, have been back in Fujian province for a long time. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, we are definitely talking about really deep political structures which are quite conspiratorial. And um, if you read the, um, if you read the uh, organizational chapters of the FCPAE, it says quite clearly um, in their description whereby they obtain charitable status in Germany, um, that they are uh, not politically affiliated, that they are not religiously affiliated, but above all, they're not politically affiliated, that they are neutral. Now that's simply not the case because the um, goals that they pursue, the people that um, push them forward, the uh, presence of the United Front, the Zhigong Party, for example, addressing these meetings of all these professionals in Europe um, who attend, and of course, not everyone goes, you know. Um, you know, this, this is very, very clear that the Communist Party is um, behind this and is organizing it. 
directly or indirectly and is calling the shots. So yeah, I'm, think, I'm, I'm afraid we do need to um, do something about all of this. Um, another example I can give you is the um, CSSA here at the Free University of Berlin, where basically they had like a hundred plus page um, brochure about, you know, join us and you'll be able to figure out how to go and find a flatmate, et cetera, where's the best libraries. Um, and then it says on page 101, and when, you know, Xi Dada and Peng Mama, so Xi Jinping and Peng Yuan, his wife, come to Berlin to visit, you can take to the streets and shout your support for them. Well, you know, there you go. It's hidden within the practical information that students do need, um, is this political organization. So I see no way around it, really. I think that, um, I think that you know, democratic countries have tried for a very long time with China to say, look, you need to don't do this or perhaps don't do that. And, you know, stop stealing our technology, the cyber espionage stuff. Obama tried it. It doesn't work. So what do we do next? We really have got to the point, I think, where we need to think about our own democratic security, about protecting our own democratic systems, because they are highly vulnerable. OK, um, <clears throat> before I put the next questions to you. I, there's a question that I need to clarify. And this question comes from Lawrence Wong, asking whether SOAS has a Confucius Institute on the first floor of Paul Webley Wing. The short answer is that you have got it confused. The institution you're talking about is the SOAS China Institute, which is not a Confucius Institute, has nothing to do with the Confucius Institute. Now, um, next question I would like to pick comes from um, Graham Le Leslie at Cardiff University. Should company acquisitions in certain sectors be opposed by states for self-protection? Which sectors? Mm. And yeah. what percentage of Chinese students are persuaded? And what percentage are forced to act in ways which will damage countries they are operating in? Yeah, that's two really great questions. Um, yes, um, states need to move to protect acquisitions in critical areas. Germany started, has done some of that. Um, there have been a couple of big examples recently, energy. Um, unfortunately, there are other examples where nothing is happening. Um, why do we need to do that? I mean, you know, in an ideal world, we wouldn't, um, but we're not in an ideal world and we are in a, in a systemic rivalry. I think that's very clear. So you need to, uh, again, you need to ensure your own democratic security, which is a term that I like because it suggests um, a form of security that is sort of not scary, that is democratic. Um, and also a way of securing democracy, if you like. So it's a term that works in both directions. Um, and that, by the way, really needs filling out. So um, if you've got people there, Steve, but you're at SOAS who want to work on the issue of democratic security in China and the West, uh, I, I think that would be absolutely amazing. Um, we do need to do a lot more conceptual and practical work on it. Um, so, you know, I mean, the sectors, I think we know the sectors broadly, they are things like telecommunications. Um, I would say that we need to actually think about health in this way, um, because the trouble is that everything is turning into data. And, you know, for example, cargo security um, screening companies, Nuke Tech, the one I mentioned, the Chinese company, um, basically these companies are becoming data companies. And the minute, you know, that starts happening, then you're in completely different territory. You're in the territory where we need to start regulating data and technology, and we need to recognize what these companies are doing. And, um, you know, privacy issues, um, data protection issues, um, it's, it's, it is getting super complicated. But I think um, company acquisition, well, we just, again, we need to identify sensitive or critical sectors. There's quite a lot of debate about that. So, so yes, we need to do that. Um, the percentage of Chinese students, this is an interesting question because, you know, I've often, I sort of ask people all the time what they sort of think about this because it's, it's a sensitive question. Again, nobody wants to discriminate. No one wants to um, be unfair. Um, 
and an answer I very often get from people who have been in the party, for example, and then went overseas. Um, in fact, one recent specific example of exactly that situation is the person simply said to me, look, any PRC citizen who's working in a sensitive area um, from, you know, it could be to do with uh, new energy, it could be, uh, it could be um, particle physics, it could be, um, you know, these, these big X-ray, incredibly powerful fast X-ray systems that they're building in some places in Europe, for example, in Hamburg up there. Um, all kinds of stuff. It could be seeds, you know. Anyone uh, working in an area with the Communist Party says we need that, you know, this is fits into our, our new plan, um, is going to be vulnerable to pressure to transfer technology. That's just how it is. Um, next, I'm going to put to you two questions which are kind of related. Uh, I'll start off with what Peter Humphrey would like to put to you. It's hard for companies and universities to perform due diligence and screen out CCP members, but perhaps they can perform due diligence on other institutions and affiliations of applicants. However, the United States used to withhold visas from Communist Party members, not only from China, but from other countries. Perhaps we should go back to that sort of yeah. rule. What do you think? Now, yeah. in parallel to that, I would also like to put to you the question from um, a Chinese person, uh, Mr. Tong Zhao. I have a problem about the Communist Party member point. I know some Chinese who are Communist Party members, but don't like the party. They joined the party because they were good students and teachers just that they should join. When they realized that they did not like the Communist Party, they could not quit. Yeah. How do you deal with those people? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, um, Mr. Tung Zhou and, and, and Peter, these are such important, difficult, really, really crucial questions. I think, the issue, I, I'm also very aware that um, there are many people who joined a party who um, may not like it or may, I mean, they may not, right? So how can we know? I mean, the problem is that there needs to be some way of raising the cost to people about joining the party in the future. If, you know, we want to manage this problem of people coming in and, uh, you know, extracting this kind of stuff um, and, and just basically having all those political contacts and ties which are invisible to the new environment in which they are in, um, like the UK or Germany. They're invisible to German UK societies, right? But it's there, it's, it's there all the time. So how do we do that? And you know, the fact that you can't leave the party um, tells us so much about the, what the party is like. <laughs> And I don't know exactly what is the best solution here. I think it needs to be talked about. I'm afraid that we probably do need to think about the fact that there will be um, people for whom this works out badly, that there's a price to be paid. It's about raising the cost. It's about young kids saying, no, well, look, maybe I shouldn't join because you don't have to join. You know, I know plenty of people from my years in China who were asked to join the party and didn't. Now, I know that some people will join just because they know it will provide benefit, enable them to get ahead, make contacts. And I'm not making a, you know, I'm not judging them or making a personal, I'm not blaming them personally, to put it better. Um, but, you know, there does need to be a way of raising the cost to all of this. So I think that uh, that's going to be a really difficult one to deal with. About the, the, the party, um, about actually outright denying entry, that's one option. Um, it's an option. I think um, it's it's a tricky one. It's it's definitely difficult to know who's in the party and who isn't. But again, I repeat the point I made earlier that you can ask people to declare, and if they lie and you find out, well, then they've kind of you know they will be punished. There will be responsibility involved with this if they are in fact um, you know if there's some kind of Farah style situation comes in Foreign Agents Registration Act, which I think it does need to. Um, 
you know, so again, they, they, they make themselves vulnerable. So the, the next step about denying entry, I actually um, suggested this in something I published back in 2018, after arriving in Germany from so many years in China and Hong Kong, 39 years in China and Hong Kong, and then coming to Germany and sort of realizing what was going on here and how none of the Germans realized what the party was actually doing in German society both in business technology and in cultural groups, social groups, um, politics, if you like, um, also politics. And I said, well, maybe we need to think about this. And I think that maybe we do need to think about it. Yeah. It's unfortunate, okay. but how else to manage the problem? You know, this is this is the difficulty. OK, next question I think comes from a SOAS student, um, Mary Stocke. Is The question is really about how would you suggest balancing the economic interests with the security risk? Um, I think the, the, the questioner was asking you in terms of how you balance uh, between uh, technology sectors from China, where China is leading. Do we accept them? Do we not accept them? Yeah, no, we don't. <laughs> we don't accept them. I think, um, you know, I don't see that, you know, I think, I think it's a reflection of our incredibly sort of economistic mindset. Um, of the last decades, that we even think that it's possible to accept, um, you know, technology which is um, outright dangerous to democracy and threatens um, privacy in really fundamental ways. Um, you know, that that we even think that we have to accept that we don't have to accept it. We, you know, even, as, even as, if it <laughs> slows down our fight against uh, climate change, that's actually yeah. somebody else. Uh, Chris uh, Arlett would like to fo follow up on that. Yeah. Now, this climate change issue is, of course, super important. Um, and also, I suspect, and I've thought for a long time, that it's an area where the Communist Party is going to use as leverage against democracies to try and like get us to look away from all these other things that are happening. The, the absolutely persistent technology theft, the hemorrhaging of intellectual property to China. You know, it's going to be if if you don't, you know, if you punish us, if you do this or that, we won't cooperate with you on climate. Well, that's a really zero sum game. Um, I would like to um, push people's attention toward an article published in Foreign Affairs recently by Andrew Erickson and somebody else. It was just a few days ago. Um, very interesting concept in there, which I think is very fresh. It's basically saying that we need to compete with China on climate and not seek to cooperate um, in a sort of a kind of naive, friendly, we're all in this together way, because frankly, the Communist Party, I don't think it really thinks it's in the same boat as democracies in most ways. I think it feels profoundly threatened by democracies and um, absolutely determined to neutralize democracies. Um, so, you know, we need to rethink how we deal with the climate issue in order to, that the party cannot use it as leverage against democracies. I think that's the, that's the basic point and I think that there are ways of doing that um, it's maybe another for another discussion or so but no you know I mean it's like you go back to a long time ago it's like well how, how do you do business with somebody who's actually determined to usurp your own system at the end of the day it's just really stupid isn't it you know to 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 use their own technologies when you've got your own when you to use their technologies when you've got your own technologies because apart from anything else China aims to replace much of the technology and the manufacturing in the West. In Germany in particular, quite an old model, you know, making machines, you know, it's very sort of 19th, 20th century, right? Um, and, um, you know, made in China 2025, but also the medium long-term science and technology plans and the China standards 2035, and also the China Brain Project 2030, which is all about AI and, you know, um, artificial general intelligence issues. I mean, all of this is aimed at essentially um, making the world dependent on China's supply chains um, and also replacing manufacturing ability elsewhere in the world. And, you know, Xi Jinping said it back in October, we want to make the world dependent on China. Um, so again, it's not a secret. It's just the problem is that we don't really listen and we don't take it seriously. And we seem to be afraid to act. That's really, you know, what it boils down to. Next question I pick comes from Jonathan, Jonathan Fenby. Um, he's really asking you about how important is the military element in the technolo technology gathering by China 
or whether that is now a moot point because it's all under the military civil fusion? Oh, it's very, very important. Um, got a couple of specific chapters on that in the book. Um, I can only, um, again, here it is. I can only um, encourage you, of course, from a um, from my point of view, to to uh, to go out and get it, get hold of it. Um, it's enormously important. There are a lot of areas um, where China still um, needs to catch up. Um, there are areas where it has, where it's already probably too late. Um, we're looking at the South China Sea, for example. China has about eighty of these sort of catamarans that. Um, fire missiles, right? So they can function in shallow waters. They are absolutely warships. It's got about 80 of them. I believe they're made under license from uh, an Australian company. Um, and they're out there now, they're in the world. Um, there's a lot of other stuff like that. A lot of the espionage in particular, and also the gray zone stuff, because remember mi military civil um, fusion MCF means that um, everything is connected on a fundamental level you have no idea what your stuff will be used for once it goes to China that's the whole point um so yeah but still there there are very specific um military um you know goals to all of this a lot of this for example quantum stuff like that a lot of this would be now in communications um uh you know the whole quantum thing was uh, a lot of it was taken from Austria and from Heidelberg um, and uh, taken back to the China Academy of Sciences in heads and through cooperations, which were perfectly legal. Um, they were just, you know, thought to be a really great thing at the time. So, you know, quantum communications and encrypted communications, these are things which technically in future, the idea is they can't be broken, that this sort of quantum communication supplies a form of encryption that can't be broken. So you can imagine, I mean, it, you know, the significance of that in any military situation is absolutely vast and why we are, you know, um, continuing so enthusiastically to supply this kind of thing to a country that has clearly made clear that it uh, really loathes the political systems, you know, of democracies is frankly beyond my ken. <laughs> Next, I'm going to read you a comment, and then I'll turn it into a question. Uh, the comment is from Henry Tillman. Tencent has, Tencent has minority investments in over 800 companies, Alibaba in over 325. These are partnerships, not intellectual theft. Licensing deals structure protect Western intellectual property. Now, the question I'm going to turn to you is, how would you suggest we deal with companies like Alibaba and Tencent? Mm -hmm. Yep, there are absolutely um, a lot of legal um, agreements between Tencent, for example, and I, when you say when, when I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. When the questioner, mm -hmm. the commentator said that Tencent had 800, I assume they meant 800 companies overseas or what? 800 companies overseas. Okay, yeah, Foreign. sure. There's a lot of, um, you know, that's the whole point about technology transfer. It works in three ways, legal, illegal, gray zone. So this would be some examples of legal, completely legal. And we've got a list, you know, in the book of how this process is working. Um, there's a specific number of um, types of transfer, legal transfer, one, two, three, four, five, six, 12 legal transfer methods, you know, in general, um, eight illegal, including espionage, counter cyber espionage, and then two, four, six, two, four, six, uh, 12 again are gray zone. Okay, so, so um, what does one, I'm so, can you just repeat that question again, the actual way you turned it into a question from being a comment? How should we deal with companies like Alibaba or Tencent? Because they are clearly private companies in China, very strong, vibrant global companies. They're not clearly private companies in China, frankly. I mean, if you um, just look at the situation with, with Ma Yun, with Jack Ma and Alibaba, what is going on there? There's a lot of to and fro discussion. There's no such thing as a clearly private company in China. Um, and to make my point, 
I think, you know, please, you know, go and read what uh, Xi Jinping himself says about the United Front and the importance of the what's called the non-state e economy, i.e. the private economy, but he calls it the non-state economy um, in the United Front activity, which is once again, all about co-opting people who do not support the Communist Party, co-opting them to support the Communist Party at home or abroad. He says very clearly that the non-state economy, i.e. the private economy is a key part of the political of, of supporting the party, that it should be, it should always support the party and the country when called upon. We are not talking about um, clear distinctions between, you know, something being a private company. That's simply not the case. When you look at the Chinese legal structure, it doesn't work. Chinese law states very clearly, um, the whole raft of laws state very clearly that all Chinese citizens and all Chinese companies, enterprises, organizations have certain duties such as to comply, to cooperate, to collaborate with the um, state security uh, demands which are set by the party and the state. Um, and that not only must they collaborate, even if you're Tencent and, you know, they must also um, they may also not say that they are collaborating. They must also keep it secret that they are in fact supporting the national security objectives of the party state. So yeah, no, I mean that whole purely that private company thing, it doesn't work. Again, we're talking about fusion, not separation. Okay, we have two minutes left. I want to squeeze in one last question. Um, it is one for seeking clarification from Jenny Bourne. Mm -hmm. They would like you to explain to people who are not so familiar with international copyright law. What is the distinction between legal and illegal technology transfer? Yeah, it's, um, if, if you think legal and illegal distinction is difficult, try gray zone, that's even harder. Um, it's, it's a complex area. We need much better definitions in law. That's something that we... Um, one of the conclusions that came out of the book, we also need better definitions of what's the concept, the known concept known as foreign instrumentality. So therefore, you know, when the, the interests of the foreign government are at work within your own society, who is it serving? We need better definition, legal definitions of that too. I mean, um, I can quote for you what it says in the book. Um, extra legal indicates that the types of transfer these organizations um, engage in typically are not subject to outside scrutiny. Hence, the legality of the transactions is unknowable. That's one way of understanding it. Um, another, way, another way would be that, for example, illegal transfers would be things like breaches of contract, um, computer network work exploitation, insider operations, reverse engineering, very popular one. The whole high-speed train network in China was, of course, was reverse engineered from German and Japanese high-speed trains. They have the Minister of Railways was very open about that. He said, we're going to, we're going to reinvent. Um, uh, examples of legal transfers would be the tech for trade agreements that I talked about. Um, something that's known as startup competitions, which when the, you know, the party state says competition, who does best, gets the money, come back, make the stuff at home. Um, direct technology purchases is of course legal. Um, and, you know, extra legal would be things like, again, like this way that we have no way of knowing all the legal systems in a, in a foreign state cannot cope with the sort of very unique reality that is the Chinese Communist Party's structures and, uh, and activities. And then you would have things like transfer incentive programs. So transfer incentives to transfer technology back to China, the people get paid for it or they get a job for it or whatever. Technology transfer centers, you know, university linked innovation parks where um, where they very much focus on bringing stuff back again overseas scholar returnee facilities in China um, recruiting brokerage websites foreign based alumni associations um, and front organizations in overseas for PRC offices so these would be some extra legal um, areas uh, there's a lot, you know, I mean, we need to do a huge amount more work on all of this. And I'm, I'm really pleased to have had the chance to just sort of broach some of it, um, at least here. 
in well, thank you very much, Didi, for sharing your uh, very stimulating thoughts with us. I'm afraid that it is my duty to draw this to a close. Two minutes past our scheduled time. I must apologize to uh, those of you who have raised questions that I have not managed to squeeze in. A few more came in in the last few minutes. Um, but please be reassured that all your questions will be sent on to the speaker for information as our general practice. With this, let me just thank all of you again and draw this webinar to a close. And I hope to see some of you again next week. Great. Bye. Thanks very much, Steve. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.